All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to see you guys, especially with um, whatever's been going around. A lot of people are really sick lately, so everybody's kind of like blocking each other off, scanning each other. Are you sick? You know, is it okay to go around you? Um, so it's, you know, it's great to see everybody here this morning, and, um, you know, it's always great to come and study God's Word together. And uh, we're going to continue our study. If you guys open your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to continue our study in music, the Bible, and the body of Christ. And particularly this morning, we're going to be discussing the instruments of the Bible. And I I will say up front a little bit, there is um, a little bit of controversy maybe on some of the instruments. One, One sect on certain, we'll talk about it when we get there. One sect will say certain instruments are wind, another will say they're stringed, but we get the idea kind of of what's going on there. But in Colossians chapter 3, just to keep in mind as we're studying, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And you know, so as we look at this, we're obviously going to consider the whole word of God as we're looking at music and the Bible and what does it have to do with us. And um, today we're going to look at instruments. And I think out of all the topics, one of the most controversial things in churches is going to be what type of instruments are okay to be used in the church. And a lot of times you got people that get in big arguments. You have people that leave the church. You have people that come to the church because of maybe certain instruments that's being used. You have a lot of opinions on this instrument's holy, but this instrument's not. If you use an organ, you're good, but if you bring out a piano, uh uh-oh, we have some trouble here because that piano was not a Yamaha piano, so it can't be in the church and be used. So we're going to just look at basically some of the instruments that's used in the Bible. And there has been, even among, I went back and looked at some of the historical things of the Hebrew nation and Israel of what instruments are to be used in their worship and in their temple. And even with them, guess what? Big surprise, they argue about what instruments are okay and what instruments are not. And so I think that's a big reason why God put so many instruments we're going to see this morning in the Bible. And um, obviously we still have those problems today, but the things we're going to cover is, is there are three basic instruments in the Bible. And also, guess what? Same thing today. Number one is, is there's wind instruments. Number two is, is there's string instruments. Number three is, is there's percussion instruments. And that's kind of a consensus on, you know, what type of instruments there are. If you think about it, I, I was talking to my wife yesterday, and I said, you know, how many instruments are there? I said, I think there's only three. And then I told her, and she says, well, there's got to be more. And then she thought about it, thought about it. So, well, no, there's not. Those are the three instruments you find, and those are the three styles of instruments we're going to see that we find also in the Bible. And so this might be a little bit boring, but I think it's kind of interesting to know and understand the instruments that are used. Number one I want to look at is wind instruments and their uses in the Bible. So if you go with me, we're going to start in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. And, there's, and by the way, this is just... I probably skipped a couple instruments because we get the idea kind of of what's going on. But in Joshua chapter 6, we're going to see here the one of the instruments you see a lot in the Bible is a horn. And a lot of times in the Bible, these instruments were some kind of animal's horn. A lot of times they were maybe a built out of a ram's horn. And after we look at a few here, I'll show you guys a few pictures that they have. And uh, a horn in the 1828 dictionary defines it as an instrument of music In the nature of a trumpet, sounded by blowing with the mouth. Guess what? We still use horns today. You still see people using it today. But in Joshua chapter 6, in verse 5, it says, And it shall come to pass, now they're at Jericho here, and, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when he hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So we see here this type of instrument wasn't maybe necessarily a instrument used in music, but more of an instrument of following commands, gathering people, preparing an army, um, bringing the congregation possibly together. And you see it used throughout the Bible. David played, just to take note, we're not going to go and look at that. David played before the Lord on cornets, which is something maybe 
a little bit similar to that, and it's more of a straight-looking trumpet. We see also that horns are always used when you see them gathering the people or before they go into battle, go into war. There's a lot of verses that deals with that. Trumpet, on the other hand, can mean curved horn. And if you go with me to the book of Zechariah, it's used there in Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, it's right before Malachi. Sometimes those little, those little books of the prophets gets a little bit mixed up sometimes. Zechariah chapter 9. <clears throat> and verse 14. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 14. It says, And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the what? So I found that verse kind of instant, uh, interesting because it says, who blows the trumpet? Lord God. Lord God blows the trumpet. But why? It says, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land, for how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine with new wine than what? The maids. And so you see what's going on there. So this instance of seeing that trumpet of how it was used wasn't a, a we're going to take time to listen to this. It's gathering, getting things ready. And so a lot of times you see instruments used like that. And in this instance, if you go back and you look at some of the Hebrew history and what they talk about their instruments and how they were used, they said a lot of times an instrument like that usually was more of a curved horn, which gave a different sound. So if you look at these instruments, when you have certain types, if you have a straight instrument compared to a curved in uh, instrument, they're going to know what that means. You know, they're going to know whether they need to go to battle, they're going to know whether they need to back off, and I'm sure they had different trumpets and different instruments to be able to follow that. There's another instrument called, that's used as the straight trumpet, the, uh, bear with me, the is a tr it's a Hebrew word, is a trumpet, which means to quiver, and usually it's thought to be straight. And Josephus in history says it's usually about a cubit long, so it's a pretty long wind instrument here. And it's used, if you go and look at Numbers chapter 10, Numbers chapter 10, And starting in verse 1. Numbers 10, verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole what? So what does that mean? That means it's going to be all one. It's made of silver. Thou shalt make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the what? Now remember, the nation of Israel, they had a very, very large camp. So imagine having to tell over a million people, it's time to stop for the day. Now if you yell that, how long would that take? Very long. But if you hear the trumpet and then the next trumpet, and you hear these trumpets, guess what? People are going to know that's the signal, that's the time to stop. They're going to also know that's the signal, time to go. And so they were used in that way. If you go to verse, um, verse 9, it says, And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then he shall blow an alarm with the what? So we're seeing here the trumpets are more of a tool of commanding people here. And ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Verse 10, Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So he's using instruments here to bring a reflection back to himself to understand everything's what's going on, what's taking place. Does that make sense? So some of these instruments are kind of, I don't know, some of them are kind of creepy looking. 
I know I wouldn't want to put my mouth on that. But um, so that, that would obviously be like the ram's horn. This would be more like certain types of the trumpet. And then they're theorized that these would be more of like the silver style trumpets. They actually found some that they dated back to like the 1400s and some of them. They were all, um, they weren't pretty like that. But, you know, they found instruments that looked like that, that had actual Hebrew writing on them, which was really cool to see. You know, you see things like this mentioned in the Bible and then you see something that's found like that. And it's always really cool to see that. Some of the other instruments of wind that you have is, is you have the ove or pipe, and this is a perforated pipe, and it's thought to be an ove. So if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, you'll see a mention here in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And I'm sure, I think we're going to come back to this passage because it mentions quite a few instruments here. But in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 5, it says, After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a what? And a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. So they bring down this instrument, and it's thought to be a certain perforated pipe, basically, of what's used. In 1 Kings chapter 31, and a lot of this is just information for you guys to go and look at, and um, I don't know what I did there. I messed that verse up. It's what I get for not looking at it. But anyway, I'll find the passage later on. But anyways, you get the idea that, you know, there's a, an instrument called a pipe that's used in the Bible. Another one, this is the one that I mentioned before, before we got started, called the sackbut. Now, there's a lot of people in the Hebrew, whatever, generations or that study ancient Hebrew. Some of them say that the sackbut is a wind instrument, and some of them say that a sackbut is a stringed instrument. I don't know because the Bible doesn't come out and say, hey, blow on the sackbut or pick the sackbut. So I don't, I can't say full assuredly, but a lot more people lean towards the fact that the the sackbut is a wind instrument over a stringed instrument. So I don't, I don't know. But it's mentioned in the Bible. So in Daniel chapter 3, and the people that mention it say it's very similar to a, um, more of a bassy wind instrument, similar to a, um, a trombone. So in Daniel chapter 3, In verse 5, Daniel chapter 3, in verse 5, it says that at the time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So you see it mentioned in the instruments, and in those list of instruments, you have wind and string instruments mentioned throughout it. So... You get the idea, basically, of what's taking place here. And then you have other mentions, which is, we don't have to go to those there, but you have the mentions of the organ there and the dulcimer, and they're considered to be something similar. You see it here in verse 5 of the dulcimer. They think it's something similar maybe to what we would equate today to a, um, a bagpipe, which some people really like bagpipes. Not really my thing, but a lot of people really like the sound of bagpipes. So you guys all know what that is? It's an old system used. What is it for? It's an organ. And then that's something similar. They said it possibly what the, uh, the sackbut was. Today, the sackbut, that's what they call it today and what it looks like today. Back then, I don't, I'm not, we don't, they don't have any documentation of what it is. But you guys all know what the organ is. And the organ was something that was, I guess, very popular and it was used in a lot of churches years ago. But, um, you know, I actually went back and listened to some of the organ and how it was used. It actually sounds quite nice and some of the, especially some of the older hymns of how it's used. And um, so it's kind of sad that you lose some instruments over time, and um, then you incorporate some instruments that maybe aren't as good as what was used previously. But, you know, the organ was used quite often, and especially church music. So the next thing I want to look at real quick is, is the stringed instruments. And we all know the holiest and best stringed instrument is the six-string guitar. 
right? Especially a Fender Stratocaster, right? You guys know what that is, right? <laughs> All right, but the Bible, unfortunately, does not mention Fender Stratocaster. Maybe in a modern translation we might find it. <laughs> Maybe we should start using that, huh? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But the first one and the most uh, big one, and especially the one that used it a lot, would be the harp. And I think we've heard, you know, you hear harps a lot of times now is used for like children's music or babies' music because it's so soothing that it basically it relaxes them and puts them to sleep. And if you go with me to 1 Kings chapter 10, we'll see here the mention of the harp, which I, I don't, I have never seen a harp used in church music. I mean, I've seen harps used in music, but I've never seen a harp in a church. Weddings, they're used in weddings, I guess, yeah. But that'd be interesting to incorporate that instrument back into church music maybe a little bit. People would be like, what is that? First Kings chapter 10. And we see here in First Kings chapter 10, in verse 12. It says, And the king made of the almug tree pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. What else did he make? Harps also and psalteries for singers. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. So they made these specific harps out of a um, specific type of wood. And some of these have, they showed some, some of these have only three strings, which would probably be more of a bassy type instrument or harp. And then a lot of them usually had, you know, you see harps with up to 50, 60 strings. And so they actually showed, you know, they had different ones for different styles of playing, different ways they were used. They were made, we see here, out of a certain type of wood in this instance. And so when instruments are made, it's more of a lecture kind of, but when instruments are made, you use different types of wood to get different tones and sounds from the instrument. So a better quality instrument would have a better quality wood, certain wood combinations to make a certain tone. And they did the same thing back then when they made these instruments. You have the mention of the viol or lute, which would be another string musical instrument of the same form, possibly, they say, as the violin, but a little bit larger, which would make sense. You see the word there, the viol, which we made our word come from the violin, which we compacted a little bit. And a lot of times they said it had six strings and it would be struck with a bow. How's a violin played today? Has less strings than that, but it's struck with what? Struck with a bow. And it's usually a wooden body. If you go with me to Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6. <clears throat> Amos chapter 6. This actually isn't a very good passage for the nation of Israel, but let's just start in verse 1 here. It says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye unto Colney and see, and from thence go to Hamath the great, then go down to Goth of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms or their border greater than your border? Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like who? That drink wine and vows and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of who? So what they're doing there, is that a good thing? No, what they're doing there is a bad thing. And you see here that it mentions that chant to the sound of the vial. So is chanting a good thing? No, you see that right there that it's mentioned. And they're chanting to the sound of the vial. And you see that a lot of times in older movies maybe. You see the guys in there and they're on the, the fiddle or playing something in there. And what are they all doing? They're all jumping around, dancing, getting drunk. Sound familiar? You see it mentioned right here in Amos chapter 6 of what they're doing. But does that make the vial a bad instrument? No, but it makes what they're doing with that instrument bad and corrupted. 
And you see that throughout the Bible. Go with me to Psalms chapter 33. We're going to see here, I mentioned it, we're going to see a, a ten-string instrument. And it came, they said, from Phoenicia and was rectangular, maybe a little bit in shape. And I, th- I think I have, a, I have a picture of that next. But in Psalms chapter 33, which this whole, I, I really like this psalm here in Psalms chapter 33. And we'll start in verse 1. Psalms 33, verse 1, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery, and an instrument of what? Ooh, we got a lot of strings going on there now, right? Piano has a lot more strings than this, but it says that it uses a 10-string instrument. They said that the type of instrument that was used was a zither, and it was another type. We'll see, I think I have a, picture of it next, but there's one more passage I just want to look at really quick in Psalms 144. Psalms 144. And verse 9, he says, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery, in an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises under the what? Something to notice here. When you see singing, the instrument accompanies the singing. The instrument isn't the purpose. The singing under the Lord is the purpose. And it's, it's so an accompaniment of using these instruments. And he says that he uses a instrument of 10 strings. Because some people get really upset that when you go from an organ, now they, comp- they compromise by bringing a piano into the church. And then when you bring a guitar into the church, there's people sometimes that just can't stand that instrument and they get up and walk out sometimes. Because the, they look at that instrument as being part of something that's not godly. But the thing is, is people have used that instrument for ungodly things just like they have all these other instruments mentioned in the Bible as well. And so the last one is, is going to be the psaltery. And it's mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 10. It's mentioned here as well, but it's also mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 5. And these are instruments that are not used, obviously, very commonly today in music. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabard and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. So they say that the psaltery was more of something that was made of fir wood and that it gave a very soothing tone. So this was like some of the instruments of what was used. You see this one right here. This was one they found somewhere over in the Middle East and it had Hebrew writing on it. And um, it was a very old piece. You have one here of a stringed instrument that's also, it's plucked, but it's also has the ability to be used with a, a bow. And then um, you have up here something that's more, they say it's like a, um, a zither or some, very, something very similar. And then you have what's just considered a harp. So those are some of the instruments. They don't look anything really like what we use today, though. But this one here looks like it's a, a guitar with a broken neck put on the side, kind of, but, um, you know, they used instruments, and they obviously got tones from it, and Middle Eastern music has a lot different tones than, obviously, what we, what's pleasing to us, and what's pleasing to our ears here, so now the big one that everybody's been waiting for, and is so, I don't know, everybody looked a little worried last week that we were going to talk about it, percussion instruments, the drum set is in the back and ready to come out, no, okay, Percussion instruments, referred to in the Bible most of the time. These are the mentions of it. It's either called a tabret, or it's called a timbrel, or it's called a cymbal, or it's called tinklers. There was triangles, there was dances, and there was also bells. These were the percussion instruments of what was used in the Bible. Now the tabret, if you go with me, the first mention of it is in Genesis chapter 31.
Which, by the way, in the Bible, there's a word that's not used in the whole Bible, and the word is drum. But the terms that affiliate something with a hand drum are used, which we're going to see here, is a tabret or a timbrel. So in Genesis chapter 31, and verse 27, And this is when Jacob comes back, we've, and um, he had left, and so Laban is talking to him. He says, Wherefore, in verse 27, Genesis 31, verse 27, Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly, and steal away from me, and didst not tell me, that I might have sent thee away with myrrh, and with songs, with what? And with harp. So he mentions a percussion instrument here. So the word that's used there is, is the word is used that's called tof. Now, a lot of people take that word and they affiliate it with a lot of other things and say that that word there refers to all different drums and refers to all drums in general and that it's a bad, bad word and it's an instrument that can't be used. If it's a bad, bad word, then why is tabrets and timbrels mentioned in the worship of God? Now, how that instrument is used, can it be corrupted? Well, we already saw they've corrupted the vial, they corrupt the harp, they corrupt the wind instruments, they corrupt all the other instruments. So why wouldn't they corrupt percussion instruments? They would do the same thing. What is referred to here is usually a timbrel or tabret, which is something similar to what we have today, which is called a tambourine. Everybody knows what that is, a tambourine. It's a little hand drum that you bang on your hand. It's also sometimes called a hadris. The Hebrew word used here, people will take in reference. We're going to look at now, if you go with me to 2 Kings chapter 23. Second Kings chapter 23. And let's start, because I want to spend some time of seeing the context here of what's going on. Bear with me. Let's start in verse 1 to see, because I think this is probably the most controversial topic, is, is talking about drums and percussion instruments and how they're used. So let's see what's going on in the context here. Starting in verse 1, it says, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Jer Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in the ears all the words of the book of the what? Guess what? They hadn't been hearing these words. And he read all the words, which, and he says, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And the, and the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. And he burnt them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in places round about Jerusalem, them also that burnt incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. Does this sound like people that are worshiping God? No, these are people that has corrupted everything of God. They've corrupted his word. They've corrupted how they worship. They're worshiping false gods. Now, don't you think they're going to corrupt the music? Then he says in verse 6, And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem under the brook of Kidron and burned it at the brook of Kidron and stamped it to small, small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. Now, man, does this guy sound like he's upset? Verse 7, And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove and he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burnt incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, 
which were on man's left hand at the gate of the city. Verse 9, Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren, and he defiled, what? Topheth. So that word, we, let's just keep reading, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom. So people will take that word and say, this is talking about all the drums that are being used. Where in this passage have you seen a mention of instrument? Now, do you think they had instruments there? Oh, I would put money on that they had instruments there. Do you think they were using drums there? I would put money that they were using drums, that they were using all different kinds of instruments there. Why? Well, it says it's going to tell us why. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to who? You know what these people were doing? They were taking their children and sacrificing them to false gods. Now, don't you think they're going to use something to cover up the noise? Now, let me ask you, people will take this passage and say all percussion instruments are evil. But if all percussion instruments are evil, why were they used in the temple and worship? Why do we see mentions of tabrets and timbrels used throughout the Bible? Which, by the way, they, they take this, this passage here and use this to show that no kinds of percussion instruments are to ever be used. Now, certain types of percussion instruments, remember what the purpose of music for is to bring honor and glory to God. Now, when you use certain types of instruments that all you hear is the instrument, what are you now doing? The glory is going away from God and it's going to the band. So is there certain types of instruments that's used that takes that glory away from God? Yes. And we have doctrine and good doctrine in us to know when that's happening and to be on guard for that. Now, drums are used all through history, and most of the time that you see a lot of mentions of drums and cymbals and these instruments used, you know what they're used for? They're used for worshiping false gods. They're used for chanting. They're used for controlling the people. And you've ever seen how they used to row the ships is they would have a big drum there, and he would beat on the drum. Why? Well, because naturally when you hear a drum, your foot starts to tap, guess what? And you start to like, but that was so that they would row in perfect, har- you know, they'd be perfectly synced because if you got one side rowing, the other side's a little bit behind, guess what? Ship's going to do circles. But the Hebrew word that's used here when it says topheth is describing a place, not an instrument. Now, it might, it's possibly describing what's taking place at this place, but it's not describing an instrument that's being used. But I definitely think instruments were being used here. This passage would show, though, how that not only did they corrupt the temple, but they've corrupted how the worship and praise goes to God because they're sacrificing their children in fire to the God of Molech. Think about how corrupted someone has to get that they go from worshiping the true and living God, the God that brings them out of Egypt by a mighty hand, sets them up. They had good kings, they had bad kings, but he sets up a covenant with his people. He blesses his people, and then you know what? They end up, they get to a point of worshiping a false god, taking the instruments, possibly of the Lord, out of the temple, and then worshiping and burning their children for false gods. Isn't that a terrible thing? And that's what happens when you get away from the word of God. That's what it leads to. But this king here is obviously going and stamping that all out taking down their groves, taking down all the things of worshiping the false gods and reinstituting it to the way God wanted it. Symbols, there's also a description of many different symbols. Now symbols, a lot of times people relate symbols with drums. But symbol is its own instrument. It is not a drum. You know, a lot of times we think of that because usually the guy has a drum set and then what? He's got symbols. Symbol is its own instrument and separate instrument. You see it mentioned, if you go with me to Psalms 150. Psalms 150, and we'll just read the whole chapter here. Psalms 150.
And it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the what? So is a symbol a bad thing? Well, I don't think they would be instructed to praise him upon a loud symbol if it wasn't. Praise him upon the high-sounding symbol. So what does that mean? Well, you have ones that are maybe bigger ones, and then you have ones that are smaller ones. Nation of Israel, I'll show you in the page. We'll just look at it real quick. Nation of Israel, you had these little ones they used in their fingers. And a lot of the same ones that you see here used in their fingers, a lot of times they were used in the little, like, timbrels and stuff, which would be similar to a tambourine. And, you know, they had different sizes of these. And then they had, um, they said they had another little small, it's like a hand drum that they could hold here and use maybe a stick or something, you know, a drumstick or their hand on it as well. And you have stuff that's kind of similar today as well. And, um, but there's a description here of many different types of symbols. But the purpose of it is, in verse 6, it says, Let everything that hath breath, what? Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So if my instrument is so big and so loud that it takes away from the praise of the Lord, guess what? That instrument is not fit. And a lot of times when you hear music, the instrument is overriding everything to where, guess what? We see the mention of instruments, but they're used in accompaniment to praising the Lord and singing. And a lot of times the focus gets off of that and gets focused on we need to have the big sounding band. But guess what? The music accompanies singing praise unto the Lord. There's history that shows that symbols were once forbidden at the second temple in the century before Christ. But according to these verses, it was okay. A lot of times today you hear people say that symbols are bad. Hand drums are bad. Certain percussion instruments are bad. Certain stringed instruments are bad. But guess what? There's a lot of variety of instruments that are used in the Bible. It's the focus of how you use those instruments. And some of the other ones that are mentioned are tinklers. And so the, it was some type of maybe little double symbol, like the little hand one, possibly. Or maybe they had two other little hand ones they clapped together. I think people still use those today in like um, Central and South America. They used little symbols like that in their styles of music that they used. So you can see the history of that music coming down still. You have larger and smaller symbols. You have bells. If you go with me to Exodus, this is just interesting. They used certain bells for the priests in Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28, and it says, And beneath, upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, the bells of gold between them, round about, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe, round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. So there was a use for those bells that you see mentioned there. Make sure basically, hey, is he still moving? And you would hear when he's coming and going. So you see the mentions there of instruments throughout the Bible. There's a lot, there's other maybe varieties and different instruments, but you see the uses of wind instruments, you see the uses of string instruments, and you also see the uses of certain types of percussion instruments. And so the word that's affiliated with those percussion instruments isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if you notice, percussion instruments aren't mentioned nearly as much as wind instruments and string instruments. But they are mentioned in certain praising and certain worship of God. So you guys, I guess we can take it how it is. But I don't see the mention of the term drum in the Bible. 
but I see things affiliated with certain percussion instruments in the Bible. I see that the purpose of music and using the instruments is to accompany singing unto the Lord. Sometimes it's used to praise the Lord, but guess what? If I just stand here and do this, how's that praising the Lord? But if I stand there and I play maybe something on the piano, guess what? A piano has a melody, a harmony, and a rhythm. A guitar has a melody, a harmony, and a rhythm. A wind instrument can have a melody, a harmony, and a rhythm. A drum cannot. But a percussion instrument can accompany other types of instruments to keep everything in time. But it's not the main instrument that's used. And you see that it, usually when a tabret or a timbrel is mentioned throughout, or cymbals, what is it with? String and wind instruments along with singing. So that's my take on the instruments of the Bible and the mentioning of them. But we understand that the result is, is that if the word of Christ is dwelling in us, we're going to know what we should be doing with those instruments. And next time I come to talk about music, I'm going to talk about the music that's in the life of the believer and how we can choose which type of music we should be listening to, which type of music we should be doing, how we should be doing it. And the, the basic summed up version of that is, is that our music is to glorify and honor Christ. And that if our music is not glorifying and honoring Christ, guess what? We're doing something wrong. And we need to honor and glorify God in every aspect of our lives. Not just in a couple areas, but in every aspect. And I think music sometimes gets put off and I'm not speaking out to you guys, I'm speaking from my own personal life, that music sometimes we don't think is as bad as other things, so we allow it to influence our lives. And, you know, we allow it to affect our emotions and affect how we are and how we're doing in our lives, and that we've already seen music is very powerful in the Bible. Music has been corrupted a lot of times, but we still can produce, as believers, good godly music today. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to come here and look at the instruments mentioned in your word and of how they're used and how that we today should be, when we do music, we should do it to bring honor and glory to you. And we give thanks always to, that we have the perfect word of God in our possession today and that we can trust it and believe it fully. And may we go out and allow your word to work in us and may we grow in your word continually. And we give thanks always by Christ. Amen.